Good morning, everybody. Good afternoon. Good evening. As Athena said, I'm Andy Rector, and I'm, I'm based in Austin, Texas. So you guys are all good with change. That's probably why you're here. The people that aren't here, I hope you guys are, are OK with change as well. I'm very comfortable with change, and it, and it starts from an early age. So I had a really great childhood. I grew up in Houston, Texas. I have two beautiful, brilliant older sisters that inspire me, uh, an artistic mother and a, an engineer and creative father. And that's actually not my dad right there. Um, <laughs> Uh, but uh, you can tell from an early age I was trying and failing to look cool. Um, but that's okay. And we had a pretty revolving door of guests coming through our house. So I said my, my mother was a creative person. She was actually an artist, a, a fairly world-renowned fiber artist. So it was a niche community in terms of felting, weaving, things like that. And so I'd wake up on a Saturday morning and there'd be some random person with a ponytail teaching a felting class and why not jump in and see what that's like. Uh, we also had lots of spiritual people that come through and stay with us. So people that were teaching people how to meditate or do various forms of spiritual healing, uh, a thing called Feldenkrais, which is uh, healing through touch. And so at a young age, I learned how to meditate, and I also learned how to see people's auras. And luckily, it's dark in here, so I can't see y'alls. Um, and lastly, we had really uh, intelligent people coming through. So we had a constant flow of foreign exchange students. So I never lived any, anywhere abroad as a kid, but we always had people coming through from different parts of the world, from different levels of their educational journey, from primary school to graduate school, uh, to this gentleman here who was actually a doctor learning how to do a very specific procedure that could only be taught in Houston. So I learned very early just to go with the flow. You never knew what you were going to wake up to and find, and, and so it was just very easy for me to, to go with the flow. And that's easy to say when it's just people coming through your house, as long as they're not too much in your space. It's easy to talk about dealing with positive change, like, hey, you got a promotion. Figure out how to deal with that change. Like, OK, yeah. Um, it's not so bad. But what's hard is dealing with change when it's not so easy. When you're halfway through the project and you're way over budget and way behind on the deliverables. When you've got lots of uncertainty, when you get acquired by a big company, uh, all sorts of things that make change scary and, and uncertain. And so what we're going to talk about today is actually building our muscles on those easy changes so that when those big changes come through, we're ready and prepared for it. And it actually, it turns out that our brains are designed to work this way. They're constantly building models of behavior of yourself and others so that you know how to then execute those models in future situations. I see this every day in my kids, and I also see this every day in the break room. So we've all been there. You see the donuts go out. In our case, breakfast tacos or barbecue. And you don't want to eat them. You tell yourself, I'm not going to do it. I'm not going to do it. You resist for five minutes, maybe 10 in my case. And then you go and you eat the donut. And what happened there is your brain just built a model that says, it's OK to lie to myself. It's OK to say I'm going to do one thing and then do another. And it doesn't sound like a big deal, but if you do that over and over and over again, all of a sudden, you're not going to have follow through across the board. And so like this, if you're going to eat the donut, don't tell yourself you're not going to eat the donut. We're really going to work on practicing on the easy things, easy tools, so that hard ones are ready. The biggest change for me really came when I went to college. So that's an experience that most of us went through. I know we all went, or not everybody, but a lot of us went to college. Most of us dropped out in college for a little while. At least I did. Uh, and then you go back again. I started working in college at a company called Austin Digital. At the time, it was about 20 people. Uh, and I applied to a job posting that said, do you like airplanes, do you like data, and do you wear flip-flops? And luckily, all three applied. And uh, when I went into the interview, I think Tom Mayer, the founder here, was just excited that somebody actually showed up and uh, just kind of told me to start working. And so Tom Mayer is kind of a genius, PhD, mad scientist kind of guy. He literally would wear belts and suspenders. And I'm convinced that we won a few deals on sales calls because he walked up after some suit guy in his belt and suspenders. And he goes, yeah, I want that guy. <laughs> um, I learned a lot. So I was 18. I was very malleable. So I have to just say thank you to some of the key leaders that molded me, Ken Cosman, Richard Pinio, and others, really molded me into the, the type of employee I am today. It also wasn't a typical startup. So you think of startups and you think of like people with kegs and I don't know, slides and weird stuff like that in Silicon Valley. And it's not, you actually note that what looks like a beer bottle there is actually Worcestershire sauce. So it wasn't really a big company. And it wasn't really a startup. 
so nobody really knew how to deal with us in, in 2012 when we were acquired by GE Aviation. And I, I will always remember when this happened. It was a very, obviously, a pivotal moment in my career. And the point I reflect on is a happy hour we, we went to at a bar down the street from the office. And there was kind of two groups of people. There was a group of people that were excited and, and cheerful and looking forward to taking our business more global. Lots of opportunity for how we could go bigger and bigger and better. And then there was a separate group of people that uh, were a little scared, right? They were scared of change. They were worried about what's going to happen to my job. What's going to happen to the office? What's going to happen to the culture? And I felt that way deep down, too. You're not going to not feel that way. We've all changed jobs. Some of us have changed companies. It's scary. I'm not saying you should just not feel that way. But it's about overcoming those feelings and then trying to focus then on the opportunities ahead of you. Uh, but in 2012, some other things happened to me as well. It's definitely the biggest year of my life. I got married. So we met Olivia earlier in the story. There she is. Uh, and I actually met Olivia right around the same time I started working at Austin Digital. And so it feels somewhat poetic that the same year we got married and took our relationship to the next level, the company was acquired. Uh, but some things don't change. So where I met my wife was in a dormitory at the University of Texas, uh, which is 0.4 miles away from our office. And so I can see out of our window the dormitory where I met her. And it's a nice reminder of where I came from and, and our relationship and how important it is to me. Now, in preparing for this, I also noticed that Google thinks the office is my house, which is <laughs> concerning. Um, so clearly need to work on some work-life balance there. Uh, but not only did I get married, uh, which is a big deal for all of you that are going through it or maybe about to get married in Amy's case, uh, but my rock and roll band got signed the same year, literally a month after the acquisition happened. And so for those of you that, that have been in bands, that means more touring, more time in the studio, time making music videos, time, 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 time. And now before you get too excited and you're like, oh man, Andy's a rock star, that's cool. Uh, you'll note that press photos are the rock and roll equivalent of corporate org charts. And you literally cannot put me further away. <laughs> so I'm at the bottom of the chart, not that cool. I stood on the side of the stage and that's where you put trombone players. <laughs> And it, yeah, and if the trombone wasn't bad enough, I'm not really sure what I was thinking with that mustache. That applies to you today, Trent. <laughs> so I'm living in a van, uh, working while everyone else is partying, uh, becoming a manager, dealing with all the change at GE, taking on new challenges. I'm married, so I'm trying to balance and be home as much as possible so I don't get a divorce in a couple weeks. Uh, so it was really a, a crazy time. And so now I'd like to finally talk about the tools I used to, to get through that, but first one, one final caveat, is just to say that you know, I'm, I'm not perfect. Nobody is. People in this room have worked on assignments, projects, et cetera, and have seen me fearful of change and scared of change and not embracing it, especially XLP projects for those of you in the room, you know that they're not always easy. But this isn't about being perfect, it's about being better and having a, a tool set that you can use to continue to improve. So let's do it, let's finally get into it. The first uh, tool I use, I call Choose Your Attitude. And so this is about not letting external factors control the way you feel about something. It's very easy to let somebody else own your emotions. You can say, no, I'm going to own my emotions. And note that this doesn't say be happy. It doesn't say be wonderful. It doesn't say be angry. It says choose the way you want to feel. So if you want to be upset about what's happening, be upset and just own that emotion. If you want to be happy, be happy and own that emotion. It turns out that uh, choose your attitude is, is pretty difficult in our human nature. We have a natural human bias towards the bad things instead of the good things. So for anyone who cycles or runs, there's this great story in Freakonomics where they talk about the tailwind headwind asymmetry, which basically says if you're riding your bike and you have a little bit of tailwind making you go faster, you notice it and you love it for about 10 seconds. And then you just think, yeah, I'm the best cyclist in the world. I'm so much faster than normal. But really, it's the tailwind helping you out. Conversely, when the headwind is in your face slowing you down, you're just telling yourself, man, if only this wind wasn't here, I'd be so much faster, I'd be so much less tired, this stupid, stupid headwind. And so choosing your attitude is about focusing on the tailwinds and not the headwinds, which is what your body wants to do. Now, this is my first talk that didn't have any technical content and I couldn't get away without having a single chart. So I'm happy to report 
and a data set of 5 million flights on average, there's 0.42 knots of uh, headwind during cruise globally. So for all of us that travel, the flight planners are doing a good job. We've got a pretty normal distribution around zero headwind. So don't complain next time you fly. So where did Choose Your Attitude come from? So not only was I the trombone player, I also did professional marching band, which is called Drum and Bugle Corps. So we're just eating away at all that cool rock and roll stuff. Um, and, and basically, Drum and Bugle Corps, you tour all summer long, uh, 64 brass players, 120 people in the core total, performing all summer, getting better and better, and eventually ending in a big competition at the end of the summer. And for those of you that were in football or soccer or, or whatever, you're thinking, yeah, this nerd uh, marching band or drum corps is not that hard. Uh, the reality is it's pretty tough. So imagine holding a 20-pound brass instrument in front of your face for some extended period of time. Even if you just held your hands in front of your face for five minutes, you'd get tired of holding your hands up there. And so in drum corps, we did this drill called circle drill. So you're holding 20 pounds in front of your face. You're running in circles, you're going in, you're going out, you're going in, you're going around, and you're playing music, so you're controlling your breathing while you're doing that. And what's unique about a circle is that it never ends. So you can't get to the end and you know, thank God I made it. You never know when they're going to stop. You just keep going and you keep going and you keep going. And so when I did circle drill at first, I really had a hard time. I kept telling myself this has to be the last time I'd come around the circle, prepare myself, start to slow down, start to get kind of lazy, and then you know what, they keep going. And so I wasn't ready for the next one. And so one night I was talking to my friend Eddie here, who's a big believer in choose your attitude to this day, and he told me, Andy, why don't you just think about that differently? Why don't you assume that there's always another one coming? Why don't you just assume that it's not the last one? And what that does is that enables you to sprint to the finish. You're not expecting the end. You're expecting another. So you have all the momentum and energy to keep going. And when they do eventually stop, you're ready, but you didn't need it. And so then it can be a positive experience of the end instead of a negative experience of it not ending. So choose your attitude. Second, have a growth mindset. So this is pretty in vogue right now. The CEO of Microsoft talks about it. We talk about it a lot within GE. For me, having a growth mindset is really about gaining intellectual capital in every opportunity you have. The best example I can think of is when you have a bad boss. Not that there's any bad bosses at GE. But if you did have one, what are you doing? Are you going home and whining and complaining? Or are you looking for ways that you can learn to be a better boss yourself and learn things you don't want to do? And then hopefully building up the courage to communicate with them about how to be better. So having a growth mindset. For me, the biggest opportunity for growth I had was in 2016 when I was asked to join the XLP program. And maybe it's embarrassing, but this is actually a very difficult choice for me. I had just become a global engineering leader of what was our startup's engineering team, but it had vastly grown. I had a great staff. We had tons of project momentum. I was happy. I didn't really want any change. Uh, but people saw something in me and asked me if I was interested in this opportunity for growth. And at the time, I was reading every night to my son, Anderson, Oh, the Places You'll Go. And for those not familiar with the Dr. Seuss canon, this book basically talks about getting out there, finding new experiences, growing. And my favorite line is, kid, you'll move mountains. So I was debating this decision every night, reading this book every night. But deep down, I knew in my DNA I had to say yes. I couldn't miss this opportunity to grow. And I did. And I thank the people that helped talk me into it, including my son, who still reads this book to this day. And you can tell he loves it. Look at those eyebrows. <laughs> uh, and so I joined XLP, and it was a phenomenal decision. I met some amazing people, many of whom are in the room here today. And any time I get concerned about the future of this company, I think about these people and, and their intellectual capital and what they can do and what they can bring to the table. And, and it's truly inspiring. So thank you. My first job on the XLP program was to be the engineering leader of the Intelligent Airport Initiative. So this was a startup within a startup within a giant company. So Rus Russian nesting dolls all the way down. And we were running around basically trying to make airports less terrible. And we all fly. It's an awful experience. So we were looking at security. We were looking at computer vision. Uh, we were looking at better ways to manage turning the aircraft around, which, believe it or not, is still paper and pen across the board. And we had a, a lot of good ideas, and we had a great vision for what we could do. But we didn't do it. We decided not to. And I was actually one of the people that recommended we shut down the program. 
So that's not easy to say, hey, this job I have where I have all this spotlight on me to go deliver impactfully for the business is not working out, let's shut this thing down. Uh, and so that could be seen as a failure in many people's eyes, but it wasn't for me. I learned so much. I learned how to design software. This is much prettier than anything I'd ever designed before. I learned how airports work. I got to run around behind the scenes at airports. I learned about culture fit on a team. I learned about things to do and not to do to start a new business inside of a big business because that's not an easy thing. So it was not a failure. But to this day, when people talk to me about intelligent airports, they get weird. They get squeamish. They act like it was a failure. And I have to remind them, no, you know, we all learned. And oh, by the way, we made good capital allocation decisions and stopped it early. It's not easy to fail fast, right? But we did it, and I'm, I'm extremely proud of that. This is core to the DNA of our company. So for anyone who's read any of Jack Walsh's books or listened to any of his interviews, he tells a story early on in his career where he blew up a plant. <laughs> so if I blew up our office, I think I would be fired. And he assumed he was going to be fired too. And he went to his boss's bosses to go you know, get, get beaten down for what he did. And instead, they diagnosed the problem to understand what he did wrong and created a learning opportunity. So this goes all the way up the company. This is in our culture, and we all have to do this, have a growth mindset. My last tool is just simply being grateful. So there's tons of health benefits out there that have shown that if you just are thankful for basic things like the air, like the earth, like your family, simple, simple things, you have better health outcomes. You live longer, you have less heart disease, all sorts of good stuff. It's simple, just be grateful. When it comes to change, it helps you keep things in perspective. So gratitude for me starts at the very, very beginning. I was born prematurely because my mother got sick with something called listeria. And with listeria, the infant usually has around a 50% mortality rate, maybe as high as 60 in some situations. This is why they tell pregnant people to not eat uh, unpasteurized cheese. Thanks, Mom. <laughs> but at the time, you know, it really didn't look like we were going to make it, uh, both me and my mom. And so obviously, I don't remember, uh, but I was there, and I fought through it. And uh, I was told this story all through my childhood, and it really became ingrained in me to be thankful for everything you got, because it very easily could have gone the other way, literally a coin flip, and I wouldn't be here. And I carry that now in my name. My name is Andrew Glenn Rector. My dad wanted my name to be Andrew James Rector, and my mom wanted Glenn. And if you think your kid and your wife aren't going to make it, you kind of say, yes, whatever you want. So my middle name's Glenn with one N. If there's any weird two N Glens. Get out of here. <laughs> um, so gratitude is, is great. It makes you feel better. It, it keeps things in perspective. If you feel like this change is the end of the world, think about all the basic things you have, and maybe that change isn't that big a deal. Who cares if we're switching the procurement system? You know, If it gets better, great. If it doesn't, we tried. So be grateful for what you have. So we're going to practice that now today. You should all have your phones still. So get out your phones. We're stealing a move from Andrew Coleman here. We're all going to text somebody and say thank you for something they did. It could be someone you work with, someone at home. Be grateful for what they do for you that helps you be a better person. Take your time. I'll give you a second. So that's it. Those are my three tools. How do I apply them today and what's going on at the company? I choose to be optimistic and energized. In the Aviation Digital Group, we have a ton of pressure, a ton of demand on our group to deliver growth and value for this company. But we're also making the world safer and more efficient. We can help airlines avoid putting 30 million kilograms of CO2 into the atmosphere. And for some perspective, each of us do about 5,000 kilos a year, which means if you know me or if you're friends with me, you're carbon neutral. And that's a big deal in Austin. Uh, second. Uh, I'm, I'm always learning every single day. So I'm an engineer by training. We kind of skipped over that. But uh, joining XLP spun me out of engineering into new functions. And I've been afforded the opportunity to take on those new challenges. But I have the support network around me to help me be successful. But I don't know all the answers. I don't know everything about my job that I should know. But I learn every day. I learn from my team. I learn from my peers. We bring in more people from the outside to help us grow. And so if you're not learning every day, you need to think about are you in the job that you want to be in to make sure you are learning. 
And lastly, I'm just grateful to be here. It's simple, you know, it goes back to my gratitude story where our company could have been acquired by somebody else. Our company could have not been acquired. We could have gone out of business. Who knows? There's this trajectory that happens, and I'm so thankful to be here with you all. We do incredible things. You inspire me. I meet new people every day that inspire me, and so I'm incredibly grateful for the opportunity to do my work and to be here with you today. So look, change is scary. It's the natural born enemy of the way things are. But we have a huge opportunity right now to move this company forward and therefore move the world forward because what we work on actually matters. So I hope you can take my three tools to heart. I hope you can share them with others to help people rise with change, to lift people up and bring them home safely. Thank you.